Everybody awake? Oh, all right. So we're going to talk about transcatheter aortic valves, intended successes, unintended consequences. Is it all good? Is it all bad? Probably not. Really have no disclosures. I am involved in some trials for some of the newer transcatheter valve options, but none that really sway this conversation. So everyone in this room has some ties to a cardiac surgery program. Uh, buzzword affiliated with those programs now is called structural heart. It's a way of uh, embedding the multidisciplinary approach to uh, involve the cardiologists and the surgeons. And you know, the goal when you do an analysis is you want some growth. And typically when you first start looking at things, you realize your growth isn't quite as fast as you think it should be. You want a lot of system support and you realize that that probably is not exactly as much as you would like. Um, marketing would be really good. Um, certainly industry has done a great job with marketing. Uh, because they've convinced everybody that transcatheter valves are uh, the end-all, cure-all for everything. Um, but, um, you know, your institution marketing might not be quite as robust as industry's marketing. Hopefully your physician expertise is through the roof. Hopefully your commitment and your team concept is uh, very solid. And hopefully your clinical outcomes of whatever you choose to put in are, are top tier. Complete program ability to offer all services, all that's very important. But as we add new things to the program, we need to make sure that we're really hitting our end goal. So why not surgical aortic valve? Why transcatheter aortic valve? Surgical aortic valve is the gold standard. Um, it should therefore be done for patients that are of, of, of quote unquote acceptable risk. But what are acceptable risks? How do we define those risks? Um, is surgical aortic valve implantation as the majority of it is done out there today done optimally and is it perfect? Is the transcatheter option optimal and perfect? Um, are we as a collective group of cardiac surgeons and cardiologists really doing the right thing for every patient? Or are we spinning it to fit what we need? We, some of us live in a very uh, collaborative society. Others live in a very siloed existence where you know, what's good for the surgeon may not be good for the cardiologist. What's good for the cardiologist may not be good for the surgeon. But in the end, we hope whatever's being done is good for the patient. And obviously, should we continue to look at options? So surgical aortic valve is pretty straightforward. We all know what it is. It comes with an incision of some sort and several days stay in the hospital and several weeks of recovery time. Transcatheter valve, looks pretty sexy if you're the patient. Um, multiple access routes, most of which are done through the femoral access with 14 French sheaths. Um, conscious sedation, it's the standard in our institution. Uh, local anesthesia, two peripheral IVs, no radial heart line. You leave the OR, go to PACU, recovery unit, go to the floor, 80 plus percent of our patients go home the next day. Um, only the ones that require pacemaker really get slowed down. Return to full activities in a week. If you're the patient, that sounds really good. Early data sent a confusing picture. It looked great if you were looking at this for high risk or risk prohibitive patients. There was an increased stroke risk. There was an increase in major vascular complications, increase in major bleeding, increased pacemaker risk. But it provided an option for those high-risk patients that really didn't have any other great options. Reduced rehospitalization, improved New York Heart Association class, greater days alive, and greater days outside the hospital. So it was a win for the patient. They did better on a six-minute walk test, and, uh, you know, we did learn that if your risk for surgical valve was over 15%, maybe you would do just as well with medical therapy. Maybe it wasn't the technology for you. 
But very quickly, it started sounding like the arguments that the cardiologists made throughout the 90s relative to stenting. Well, you can't compare this stent to that stent because that was old technology. This is new technology, and it's going to get better. And to some extent, that was an applicable argument, and it has gotten better. When we look at transcatheter and surgical aortic valve length of stays, um, what we saw was a steady drop off uh, from about 10 days on average to oh, between five and six days on average between 2012 and 2015. We saw surgical average valve length of stay also drop some, but it didn't equal that of transcatheter valves. It kind of plateaued between eight and 10 days. If you're the hospital, this is the slide that really bothered you because transcatheter valves are expensive and the profit margin, contribution margin, wasn't nearly as great per encounter as it was for surgical valve. If you look at uh, the evolution as volume ramped up, and this is from our institution, in 2015, the average contribution margin per case was $7,000. And that's compared with about $35,000 for a surgical aortic valve. So it certainly got the hospital's attention. What were we doing right or wrong with surgical aortic valves? Were we appropriately risk stratifying these patients? Is Euroscore and or STS perfect? Um, it leaves out a few things. It leaves out deconditioned state, frailty, um, functional status of the patient. So you can easily have a acceptable or normal risk at the STS score, but a moderate, high, or even risk prohibitive patient. When we look at what's happened through the last several decades, we look at uh, bioprosthetic valve numbers increasing. That's the majority of valve type placed in the aortic position. Some 80% of patients receive a bioprosthesis. And over the last decade plus, we've seen a creep of this implantation strategy into younger patient populations. Bioprostheses come in all shapes and sizes. I'll show you some lovely pictures uh, as we go along, but basically they can be stented, they can be stentless, they can be allografts, they can be autographs. Uh, but by and large, the stented bioprosthesis is the most frequently implanted variety. Um, the stentless version, as if you look at the literature, hasn't really been shown to be superior. Uh, allografts have uh, been shown to have a higher rate of structural valve deterioration. And both of these can present issues at the time of transcatheter valve implantation. So it's probably a good thing that surgeons tend to put in more stented valves. More and more younger patients are opting for bioprostheses because reoperations compared with the 80s, have a very low risk. I mean, there's a mortality risk of around one to one and a half percent with a reoperation. Um, surveillance echo is readily available and more and more people are presenting earlier and earlier with symptomatic aortic stenosis. Most of these younger people, however, have bicuspid valves. Uh, the literature has shown us that the success is dependent upon a multitude of variables. So if we, look at what's happened over the last 15 years, we see that cardiac surgeons and cardiologists to some extent, but I can only speak for the surgeons, have been conditioned to basically believe that TAVR is the end-all cure-all of their surgical aortic valve reoperations. It's okay, we'll put a, a surgical aortic valve in you, bioprosthesis, and then when it fails, we can put a transcatheter valve in you. Most surgeons live in a siloed environment. Most surgeons have not participated in a robust multidisciplinary structural heart team where they really sit down and think about what fits this patient best and truly weigh the pros and cons of each uh, modality. You could argue that heart teams might be biased because most of those were formed to help facilitate TAVR involvement. So you, there's a little bit of a yin-yang there. The other interesting thing is when you look at their literature, the majority of stented bioprostheses implanted are 23 millimeters or smaller. We know that small valves implanted in our average American patient 
uh, can result in patient prosthesis mismatch. This is where the valve is relatively small given the patient's body size. This equates to a reduced functional class, a reduced regression of LVH, impaired coagulation, and increased adverse events in these patient populations. Yet we still see that the majority of valves implanted are between 21 and 23. There's a nice review that looked at some 81,000 patient years, 354 explants. Uh, these were, uh, because of the institution that looked at their data, these were primarily Edwards uh, products. 44% of those explanted were for structural valve deterioration. The risks, as deemed by this review, were younger patients, i.e. patients less than 60, patients on lipid-lowering agents, patients with patient prosthesis mismatch, and patients with higher peak or mean aortic valve gradients. Um, not unlike a number of the patients that we see coming through in today's world asking for a bioprosthesis and or patients that have been historically implanted and looked at, they're now in lipid-lowering agents. They may or may not have been undersized with their valve at the time of implant. And that the effect of gradient on structural valve deterioration was greater in the younger patient population. So as we see this creep to younger patients, we see perhaps some unintended consequences of what we may be leaving them with in the future. So when 12,500 plus valves were analyzed, some 72% of those valves were of size 23 or smaller. That means that some 28% only were 25 or larger. Recommendations from this paper was that uh, selection of the most efficient bioprosthesis would be very important and that consideration for root enlargement might want to be uh, considered at the time of the procedure. I would venture to say that most cardiac surgeons do not routinely do root enlargements. So this is an example of the various valves that are either on the market today or have been on the market in the not so distant past that patients are walking around out there with every day. As you can see, there's quite a selection. Interestingly enough, when you look at them for transcatheter valve, they all look very different on fluoro. Historically, we tell our older patients that um, these valves will last 15 to 20 years. Our younger patients, we tell them that we're not sure how long they're going to last, but we hope they last you a long time. We will oftentimes give them anecdotes of Mr. Smith that appeared 20 years after having a valve placed at age 35, and for some reason that valve lasts a long time in him, and you know, we hope you get the same amount of durability. But the reality is when you look at years to failure, you see things kind of peak around the 10, 11 year mark. You don't see it peaking at 15 plus years. So we don't currently really have a 15 to 20 year durable surgical valve. It's important to remember when we start looking at our patients. These are the current FDA approved transcatheter devices. Again, very different. Uh, two predominant players in the market, Edwards and Medtronic. But again, very different, but with their own attributes and their own shortcomings. There are a number of transcatheter heart valves out there either uh, being considered, maybe have been tried, maybe have been pulled, but basically, as you see, there's almost every size or shape you could think of. Each of these has perhaps an intended or an unintended consequence. Lo and behold, resurrection of the quote-unquote sutureless valves. There's two on the market currently. Percival, nice sign outside the door. Um, in theory, gives you a larger valve for a same size hole and allows you to place that valve with some anchoring stitches and then a balloon type deployment to achieve essentially a transcatheter type result with a surgical valve uh, and debridement of the valve tissue and periannular debris. The other one is uh, from Edwards, Intuity. Looks very different. It looks a lot like their Magna Ease, or, yeah, their Magna Ease valve. Uh, 
with a skirt on it that looks a lot like the skirt on their Sapien 3 um, tra Taver valve. But again, it has, as a unintended consequence of the popularity of transcatheter valves, kind of pushed the surgical valve to reconsider, can we, can we make a better option for the surgical patient? And what does that mean? Well, it means that we have a lot of bioprosthetic valves out there. A lot of them have been placed in young people, younger people, anybody under the age of 70 is getting a lot younger to me these days. So, uh, so by and large, there's a ton of these valves out there. The good news is we have, with transcatheter heart valve technologies, an option for treating some of them. Mean aortic valve gradients typically drop to the mid-teens. Aortic regurge goes away. And New York heart classification typically returns to class one or maybe class two. However, the mechanism of failure of these valves matters. Stenosis portends a higher mortality rate than insufficiency. The label matters. Small valve sizes, less than 21, 21 to 25, or 25 or greater, the bigger the valve, especially if you're in the 25 or greater category, the lower your valve-related mortality. We see papers in the literature that look at surgical valve implantation in patients versus TAVR in the quote-unquote low to intermediate risk category. It's a very gray line there. And what we find is that surgical valves offer lower pacemaker rates. By the way, having a pacemaker isn't necessarily a good thing. And less paravalve regurgitation. But transcatheter valve now offers lower bleeding rates and faster return to normal lifestyle. Comparable clinical strokes and mortality. Remember the word clinical strokes. So, you know, we have this technology, again, intended, unintended. And so here we see an example of a, of a lovely patient who had previously had a surgical valve implanted. It failed. They were evaluated and found to be an appropriate candidate for a transcatheter valve. Their coronary heights were a little bit low relative to the previous valve. And so they ended up with a valve and valve, a stent in the left main, and good flow in the right coronary artery upon aortic root angiography. So we would pat ourselves on the back and say, this is really good. Look, we saved them an operation. Uh, they didn't have to have their chest split. And uh, they got a really nice transcatheter result. So let's fast forward six to 12 months. Unintended. Same patient. Look at the left main. Nice arrow to the right of the screen. There's a nice left main coronary stenosis, which is instant stenosis and the right coronary artery is gone. So, valve's working great. What's going to kill the patient? Left main stenosis and no right. So, everything we do in life has intended and some unintended consequence. If we look at incidence of coronary obstruction, the good news is that the majority of surgically implanted valves are stented valves because they actually have the lowest incidence of coronary obstruction. The exclusion is stented with externally mounted leaflets, and those are a minority of the valves implanted. We've already talked about these smaller surgically implanted valves, so what do we do about them? Well, somebody got really bright and went to the bench and took some balloons and figured out what it would take to fracture the cages of these devices to see if one could upsize. Um, this is 100% off-label, by the way, just to, to be clear. Um, but it does work in all but two of the uh, varieties that I showed you. It does not work on the trifecta, which is a, a stented valve with leaflets on the outside of the stent, and it doesn't work with the Medtronic Hancock valve, which is one of their prior generation valves. This is an example of what that true balloon dilatation uh, would do. It basically fractures the rigid ring and allows the fabric skirting to stretch a little bit. And oftentimes in the transcatheter world, that will get you up one size. Um, you end up dilating two or three times post-delivery uh, 
to really get that valve to expand. But, but it does oftentimes make a difference, and it will give you a much lower gradient. So considerations when analyzing our patients are, gee, surgical valves have been around for about 50 years. Transcatheter valves for 10. So we have a lot to learn. Um, the transcatheter valve design is evolving. What we're putting in now isn't what we started with 10 years ago. Learning curves are important. They're there. They're less steep than they were starting off, but there is a learning curve with each new transcatheter heart valve technology. The boundaries between low, intermediate, and high risk are not universally standardized, and it's fairly easy to upsize your patient if you really want to. So there is some degree of bias, but in general, there's this downward risk creep, which is an unintended yet potentially beneficial effect of having transcatheter valves. STS risk scoring is beginning to relook at some of the uh, variables in the equation because we realize that frailty oftentimes adds a two to three fold multiplier to your surgical morbidity mortality. We've talked about what leads to early structural valve deterioration, small roots. You want to choose a larger EOA when appropriate. And perhaps transcatheter valve, depending on durability, could offer you a better option than a surgical valve if you're going to get a better EOA in that. If a surgeons and cardiologists were telling patients every day that TAVR is going to be their bailout when they're at age 50, 55, as I had a patient this past week, who wanted a transcatheter valve, actually he was 48, wanted a transcat, I'm sorry, wanted a surgical valve, but he wanted a tissue valve. And he wasn't going to hear anything other than a tissue valve. And he had gone online and was convinced that when it failed, he was going to get a transcatheter valve, but I had to explain to them that it might not necessarily make sense for all of his future needs. So you really want to be honest with your patients and make sure that you're setting them up for, to meet their expectations down the road. Perhaps sutureless valves are going to be some sort of an in-between. You know, maybe they offer us an ability to give the patient a bigger EOA and a more durable valve, but we don't know. We don't know what that durability is. Um, maybe TAVR is the answer for the small root. Um, maybe cage fracture is an answer for surgically implanted valves that are small to get a little bigger valve in. But there's no doubt that the technology is going to continue to evolve. My most recent series, 98% of my valves have been 25 or larger. There's no question that one of the reasons for that is I understand the importance of having the patient set up for success. There's a joke among a number of my colleagues. They'll ask me what size valve I place, and then they go away shaking their head. If you think about it, it's not hard. You really want to debride that annulus appropriately, and a millimeter on each side upsizes you one valve. So you really just want to take the time and do it. If you're settling for a smaller valve so that you can do it through a smaller incision or a minimally invasive approach, and you're really not looking down the road, then you're probably hurting the patient. You're not helping yourself or the patient. I haven't put any implants in smaller than 23, and that was one particular patient who was extremely tiny. On the other hand, when you look at the results that our cardiology colleagues and, and my colleagues that uh, only want to do transcatheter valves can tell patients, they go, gee, look, 0.9% 30-day stroke, clinical stroke, 0.9% uh, mortality, and no severe or moderate AI. So intended, intended consequences are a collaborative approach. We all benefit from a collaborative approach. You've heard everybody who spoke today almost universally say that. It gives us options for high risk and intermediate risk patients. It improves the EOA for small aortic annually. It's a less invasive approach, limited to no ICU stay, shorter hospital stay, and earlier return to normal activities. Unintended, there may be a misconception that transcatheter valve is an end-all cure-all for structural valve deterioration, irrespective of the initial size. If you have a 19 valve implanted, there is no transcatheter option that's going to give you a suitable outcome. The assumption is out there that the durability of TAVR is equal to that of SAVR. 
although there may be some early data that shows that at 10 years, you're going to see a fair amount of structural valve deterioration. There's higher subclinical infarcts. Remember I've said clinical infarcts are comparable or less, but subclinical infarcts can be as high as 70 plus percent, and Dr. Lumsden is going to talk to us about the unintended consequence of that as we go down the road. There's this willingness to accept paravalvar leak that was never there in the surgical arena. Uh, my cardiologist would have freaked if I left the OR with a valve with mild AI, but now it's okay. Um, increased likelihood of pacemaker is at least twofold. It did, however, on the upside of unintended, get us to reassess the variables in surgical and transcatheter aortic valve models to incorporate these variables so that we can truly point patients in the right direction. It comes with an increased cost to society and the hospitals, and we're going to have to figure out what to do with that. It has given us a renewed interest in some other surgical options that perhaps would not have been as enthusiastically uh, reviewed had it not been for transcatheter valves. And with that, the red light just went off, so thank you. Thank you.